Good afternoon, do you all hear me now? Yes, okay. So um, welcome everybody today to uh, the celebration of the renewal of the collaboration agreement between the, the JRC and Sen and Senelec. This is a very good opportunity for us to celebrate because we are coming from a very good collaboration with Sen and Senelec, not only from the past five years, but from different agreements that have been taking place since 1994. Today, we will be looking at the achievements of our last five years in our collaboration between the GRC and Sen and Senelec, but more important, we will also be looking at future achievements and how best to exploit our mutual collaboration in the next, next five years, looking ahead and also in being more effective in contributing to the new standardization strategy. Today, our event will have a duration of 90 minutes and it will structure first with a welcome and opening with a duration of 15 minutes. And then we'll have the main part of our uh, event, which will be 60 minutes of a panel discussion with experts they will be joining us in our discussion. And later on, we'll close in the last 15 minutes with a closure keynote message from uh, our invited speakers. So first, I would like to give this welcome and opening to our Director General of the GRC, Stephen Quest, who will be followed later by SENS President Stefano Calzolari. So please, Stephen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Fabio, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, let me first of all welcome you and uh, and, and thank uh, both the the European Committee for Standardisation uh, and the European Committee for Electrotechnical Standardisation, as well, of course, as my my own colleagues in the Joint Research Centre for organising this event. Uh, as you as you well know, a month ago now, the the Commission presented its new European Standardisation Strategy. And this is really key for ensuring the European Union's technological sovereignty uh, and our leadership, as well as the promotion of our values, because the strategy calls for increased agility uh, by better anticipating and prioritizing uh, increasingly urgent standardization needs in strategic areas. And it also calls to improve the governance of the European standardization organizations. Uh, it aims to support bridging uh, research and standardization, uh, as well as boosting the, scare, the share of newly skilled experts uh, through increased engagement with universities. And the strategy also calls to increase the coordination uh, of member states' interests in international standardization organizations, uh, so as to strengthen the European Union's voice in the global standardization stage. So I really would like to invite you to reflect further in this session on how this renewed collaboration between our organizations can contribute uh, to these goals and achieving our objectives. Uh, of course, working together, we've already achieved a lot. Uh, the Joint Research Center and the European Committee for Standardization have been collaborating for more than 30 years. Uh, I think our first agreement was signed back in 1994 uh, and it was renewed in 2021. And one of our most successful initiatives, which we are jointly developed uh, and, and are pushing forward is the Putting Science into Standards Initiative. Uh, and this aims to facilitate the, the identification of new sectors or new emerging science and technology areas that could benefit from standardization activities and help us therefore to promote uh, Europe's industrial competitiveness. And the workshops that we organize gather stakeholders from different backgrounds, whether they're researchers or industry, business, um, standardizers themselves, policy makers, uh, brings them together to assess and to recommend actions uh, that are needed to start the process, um, either of drafting new standards or complementing already existing standards. Uh, our most recent workshops in this area have been on quantum technologies and on organ on chip, uh, and these have led to the establishment of dedicated platforms uh, to coordinate standardization by European stakeholders. The renewed collaboration agreement, which we signed in 2021, reflects really a unique opportunity to, 
to bring together different stakeholders of the standardization ecosystem and will allow us uh, at the Joint Research Center to continue to provide state-of-the-art inputs into these different processes. So we're very keen to explore new ways to anticipate future standardization needs, um, to develop horizon scanning and foresight activities, uh, as well as to scale up this putting science into standards uh, activity in the Commission uh, and beyond. Because in short, I think we need standards faster uh, and we certainly need standards that are in tune with the European innovation and policy agenda, as well as helping us to deliver on the broader sustainable development goals. And if we just think of the different issues that are confronting us in today's um, current affairs, whether it's um, uh, COVID-19 and medicine production, or whether it's uh, critical raw materials, whether it's the clean hydrogen value chain, whether it's low carbon cement, uh, whether it's chips or data standards, uh, all of this uh, uh, requires the input of standardization experts. Um, and uh, I think that this need for standardization experts is crucial because uh, standards rely on the best experts. Um, and Europe is facing a bit of a generational shift in this field. Uh, so uh, the JRC is also keen to promote more academic awareness on standards. Um, and here, for example, we want to leverage uh, the tool that we have now in the EU Academy, which is an online platform, which is going to be officially launched this year. It's currently running in a beta version. And we want to use this platform to disseminate training and capacity building on standardization as well. So uh, I really wish that you have all a very interesting workshop. Uh, and that you can really engage together in, in taking stock of our collaboration and also shaping the future towards the most effective and strategic contribution to the new European strategy possible. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. Indeed, the, the collaboration between the experts in science at the GRC with the experts on standardization at Sen and Senec is one of the main ingredients of the success of this uh, collaboration. Uh, please, Stefano, now the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Fabio. Thank you, Stefan. I feel really honored for your invitation. For me, it is uh, the first time here in this meeting. And of course, I hope to meet you in person as soon as possible. I think uh, uh, you have already highlighted uh, the value, the great value of our collaboration. And uh, for this reason, now, I want to emphasize a little bit more the reason on that we see on our side uh, regarding this cooperation. For me, it is not easy to speak spontaneously in front of a computer in an empty room. So I prefer to read a short speech that I prepared for the occasion. Of course, I want also to to say a warm welcome to the audience, also from my side. It is a pleasure to have been invited to celebrate with you the renewed cooperation between JRC and SEN Senelec, which I am proud to represent today as president of CEN. But I am, I am also speaking on behalf of uh, Mr. Wolfgang Nizella, president of CENELEC. However, before getting to the heart of the celebration, let me say a few words about Ukraine and the terrible war it is undergoing. Sen Senelec have sent immediately a warm message of solidarity with the people of Ukraine and with our Ukrainian colleagues of the National Standardization Organization of Ukraine, that is a companion standard body. But not, not only, we have also put on hold all our activities with Russia and Belarus. There was no other possible behavior because our world of standardization is a world of peace and we care for democracy, respect for the rule of law, human dignity and shared prosperity. Although we are a technical and not a political organization. In other words, to build trust, progress and peace is the fundamental goal of our standardization system. And we can only grow in a world where peace, freedom of self-determination of peoples and consensus are guaranteed. I'm sure that the same principles also apply 
to your world of research and innovation. Having said that, we can go back to the celebration of our renewed collaboration, which was formalized at the end of the last year. I have many good reasons to be here today and to bring you the great appreciation of Sensenelec for your important work with the standardization system. I know that the staff in Sen and Senelec Management Center consider the work with the JRC as real team work with the benefits of this friendly and collaborative spirit being perceived in both our organization. And I'd like to thank once more JRC for this fundamental relationship that enables an invaluable exchange of knowledge and expertise between scientific research and European standardization. To appreciate even more our agreement, we must take into consideration that Sen and Senelec Strategy 2030, which is the forward-looking document that uh, will guide the two organizations over the next decade, recognize scientific input into the standardization processes as being crucial in order to make standardization fit for the future. That collaboration takes several forms including the contribution that the JRC scientists are providing to our traditional standardization activities by working alongside experts in our technical committees. More than 50 JRC scientists are represented in different Sen and Senelec technical bodies, working on different areas, including nanotechnologies, hydrogen, ambient air, eurocodes, and many, many more. In addition, we recognize the value of this collaboration in fostering pre-standardization activity that is setting the basis for the standards of tomorrow, identifying key innovative areas where new standards should be developed. In other words, JRC staff are well-placed to provide input on pre-normative and co-normative research and to represent an interface between research and policy making. Therefore, JRC, in its cooperation with Sensenlec, plays a fundamental role also in the light of the European priorities and needs for standardization, especially in the new fields, the green and digital transitions, where research and innovation are certainly the main drivers of the expected development of the civil society. I ask myself a question. What could you do in these areas without an adequate connection between the industrial world and that of research innovation? The answer is that we cannot do anything significant without a constant exchange of scientific and technological culture on the frontiers of the applicable knowledge. For this reason, our joint Putting Science into Standards Action, which is the flagship collaboration initiative between JRC and Sensenelec, has proven to be a successful tool that over the years has gained traction and achieved concrete results, which will be reflected in the panel discussion of today. I am very pleased that the Putting, Sci the putting Science into Standards initiative is recognized in the European standardization strategies as an important exercise to identify future standardization opportunities early on and build important bridges between the research innovator and standardizer communities. And I remember well the meeting of Saint Senelec a month ago in Brussels with the DG Grow of the European Commission, where it was said. I am repeating to the letter that they would like us, the standardization system, to be plugged into the innovations community. And this can certainly happen by putting science into standards. Therefore, I repeat once more that the JRC has a role of increasing importance for Sensenelec. And I do my best as Chen president with my colleague Wolfgang Nizella, president of Chenelec, to help this crucial cooperation to grow. Together with our CCMC Director General, 
Mrs. Elena Santiago, and the head of our innovation department, Ashok Ganesh, and all staff. In this perspective, we should build on this recognition, recognition and identify new opportunities to scale up the putting science into standard tool and our collaboration in general. We should look together to increase the number of putting science into standard actions each year from 2023. In other words, if we consider the last document of the European Commission about the EU strategy on standardization, we must transform the title of its chapter five, cutting edge innovation that fosters time standards into reality. Let me say some final words. Our standardization system builds on a strong connection with the industry. And of course, with the entire productive world in all sectors. A standard are mainly developed to serve this world and are based on its need for progress before becoming useful to the market and citizens. Therefore, standardization is a vehicle for research results to be disseminated and widely adopted in the market. And for this reason, we need to improve our dialogue even more because important pre-normative activities are expected. Let me say this concept in another way. These pre-normative activities are expected soon to help the ordinary standardization process to take the right direction towards the goals set by the European community, especially the two transitions. We, in Sen and Senelec, fully recognize the need to evolve our standardization deliverables in this light. And we are fully committed to working with the commission to support these transitions. And today it is a great occasion to, to take stock of what we have achieved so far. And more importantly, to look forward to future opportunities to explore together. I wish you, I wish you all a successful and productive event. And thank you very much again for your kind invitation. I feel really honored to be here. Thank you, thank you. Stefano, and thank you for your words. And I can only agree with you that the collaboration has been not only friendly, but very effective. And we had been practically meeting with uh, your group once or twice a week. So it was almost felt like part of our institution. And I can see here a common denominator, research, innovation, standardization, how is the contribution of one to the other? And for this now, we'll have a panel session with a duration of one hour, where we have invited four experts that they will talk about their experience on putting science into standards from the past and how their lessons learned can serve us to shape the future in having a more effective tool on putting science into standards. But before giving the word to the panelists, I would like to open uh, a poll um, such that you can give your uh, input to the poll. Here is the poll. Can standardization promote the exploitation of scientific and technological developments? Is it yes, maybe, or maybe not? Well, I see that uh, the, the numbers are approximately for the yes, approaching uh, 90%, between 85. Let's see, let's wait a bit more until they stabilize. Yeah, so there's something on the order of 85% yes, 15, 12% maybe, and just a few no's. So I hope that this workshop can confirm those that think yes, and even give more grounds to keep on working more effectively on this. And for those that maybe, maybe you can give us your input on where you see that we can improve our work in better exploiting uh, standardization as a vehicle for research and innovation. So um, now I would like to uh, introduce our four speakers and uh, 
for the first part, each of the speakers will have a very brief introduction of who they are, uh, also giving a description of their uh, initiative on their role and what they achieved for a total duration of about 15 minutes. And then afterwards, we have a more dynamic session of questions and answers. So I would like now to invite uh, Bernard uh, Gindros. He's chair of uh, Senes and Elec JTC uh, 6 of the Hydrogen in Energy Systems. So you have about three minutes, Bernard. So can you give your experience and on, on your uh, initiative, please? Thank you very much, uh, Fabio, for this kind introduction as well. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to illustrate the successful collaboration between Sentinelec and GRC with the example of what was achieved in the context of hydrogen in the energy uh, system. Um, I, let me give you an overview about this uh, hydrogen storyline in support of our uh, EU decarbonization strategy and also uh, competitiveness through boosting innovation to markets. The story um, started with the Sense and Elect Sector from Energy Management Energy Transition, I was chairing, where we conduct and permanently update um, Technology Watch in the energy sector and organize annual workshop in a way to identify if one of the emerging or promising topics identified would be relevant for further consideration. And thus, eight years ago, hydrogen was one of those topics. We are, when we communicated to Sensenelec about organizing a SPEM uh, annual workshop, our colleagues from Sensenelec proposed to organize a wider event in the framework of the joint initiative on putting science into standards. And this, uh, this is the beginning of this uh, successful story. The step-by-step -step process that was initiated by GRC and with the GRC through an intense collaborative uh, co-leadership was first to organize this uh, uh, PSIS uh, workshop. It was in Patton at GRC premises uh, with high level panelists, speakers from industry, research organization, policymakers, and standardization. And among the outcomes of the workshop, we were encouraged to launch a kind of working group or open platform dedicated to the topic of hydrogen in the energy sectors. So, uh, thus, we created and launched um, in the, the framework of the Sense and Elect Sector from Energy Management Energy Transition a working group. Um, with a co partnership with GRC, and with the aim to map existing initiatives, maturity of technologies and value chains, but also gaps and barriers that prevent the acceleration of the development of a um, hydrogen market. More than 80 experts joined this working group and participated to the mapping exercise and drafted also recommendations. The recommendations were split thanks to the inputs from GRC also, and especially in four main domain of needs. The first one was to identify if there would be a need for improving the legislative or regulatory framework. Second, about further support to research development and innovation uh, pro programs, but also consideration of pre-normative research work in the, the EU funding uh, research and development and innovation program like uh, uh, the Horizon 2020 at that time, but also Euramet MPR project. And GRC is particularly essential for this uh, type of topic. Then the fourth one was to identify needs for sensation development. We, have, we wrote a complete report that has been published as a European Commission GRC report in 2015 and uh, emitted many recommendations that have been uh, adopted, almost all of them, in the, uh, the, the years that follows this uh, report and recommendation. It was also a proposition to create a sense and elect uh, hydrogen technical committee, and we launched, and the technical board of Sen and Senelec, both of them, approved the creation of the sense and elect GTC6. I have the great honor to, to chair it today. And we kept the, the existing working group on hydrogen as a kind of open platform when we can discuss quite freely, be more agile and flexible, but also uh, GTC6 as a place where we can draft standards. All these recommendations were followed. I have to say also that all the recommendations concerning the future support to research development and innovation, including the pre research, have been fully integrated in the 
at that time, the fuel cells and hydrogen not a dictating call for proposal under the Horizon 2020 framework. And same about the prenormative and metrology with Euramet NPA. In 2018, we updated the report that is very relevant today. And I can say that this has been uh, the key to the successful collaboration. And today, we are ongoing uh, with this uh, type of activities. And the SREM Working Group Hydrogen has a strong increase of activities, as for instance, through the organization with the GRC still, the European Commission, Clean Hydrogen Joint Undertaking and Hydrogen Europe, of a series of workshops dedicated to the mobility sector in hydrogen that were held uh, early February in support of the Green Deal and the Fit for 55 related roadmaps. And I have to say that in short, the story, the success, uh, successful story of hydrogen in the context of the collaboration between Sentinel and GSC is extremely fruitful and extremely relevant. And especially as was said by Fabio uh, before, because it impels some implication of science to standards, but also because it helps in anticipate needs and give more agility and flexibility. So that's a very shortly um, my, my, my first contribution and the illustration about the successful collaboration. Yeah, thank you, Bernard. And I can see that you mentioned mapping standardization needs and then coming up with recommendations, setting up a, a working group. Uh, before introducing Claudius, um, I would like to remind all the participants that you can use the questions and answer uh, chat to pose your questions, which will be addressed later on at the end of this uh, panel session. So uh, I would like now to invite Claudius Klein. He's part of the coordination and support action of the EU quantum flagship. He's from, v from VDI. Please, uh, Claudius, you have three minutes. Thanks, Fabio. And thank you also again uh, from my side for the invitation and uh, the possibility to take part at this workshop today. Um, yes, as you said, together with my colleagues, we are leading the uh, coordination and support action of the European Quantum Flagship Initiative. Um, and that's this initiative does not only combine until now more than 20 uh, running uh, research projects, um, it also makes sure that we stay at the forefront of quantum technologies in Europe. Um, the Quantum Flagship Initiatives also is a community-based action, brings together more than 3,500 experts from all over Europe, and it acts basically as a kind of backbone for this field. Um, this does not only um, include experts from academia and industry, but also covers other areas like uh, educational experts um, or initiatives for international collaboration. And of course, also as a very important pillar, standardization. Um, in this function, I had participated in the Putting Science into Standards workshop uh, on quantum technologies uh, back in February 2019 in Brussels. And this workshop not only was very informative, it was also really the fundament of the following actions and became more and more uh, valuable for us. Based on the interactions and the results of that workshop, the Pan-European Focus Group was set up and is still working very effective uh, with initially more than, I think, 150 participants. And our experience really is that if you want to set up a working and sustainable ecosystem, um, I think that is really independent from the actual topic, and I will not go into details about quantum technologies here, don't worry. Um, standardization is a very important part of this. Standardization is not only uh, about producing standards uh, that are, of course, important, as we already have heard today, uh, for um, industry and system integration, but it also ensures interaction and exchange among, uh, among the stakeholders. And for our case, we can really say for sure that this was not only very helpful, but really a necessary game changer for us. Uh, thank you, Bernard. Hey, Bernard, sorry, Claudius. <laughs> thank sure, you, Claudius, sure, for your introduction. Uh, yes, you mentioned something important, the link of standardization with the quantum flagships. In this case, we link with a flagship, and you mentioned also the interaction with other stakeholders and you're using the standardization as a vehicle to promote this interaction. So now I would like to invite Maurice Whelan. He's head of the unit of the chemical safety and alternative methods at the GRC in ISPRA. Please Maurice, 
tell us about your experience. Uh, thank you, Fabio. Hello, everybody. It's a, a great pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, so most of the work uh, of my unit, the Chemical Safety Alternative Methods Unit here at the, the JRC, hmm. is about supporting different policy areas and regulations um, that deal with ensuring um, worker and consumer safety, um, you know, in relation to all kinds of chemicals that we're exposed to every day, whether it's through um, the cosmetics or personal care products we use, the food and drink we consume, medicines we take, or disinfectants you might use in the home, or chemicals also used in, in different industrial settings. Um, our focus um, is primarily on, on chemical hazard risk assessment, and in particular on developing, validating, and, and promoting new ways to do toxicological testing. So in that respect, we're very much involved in, in pushing for non-animal approaches um, that are not just a means of avoiding animal testing for ethical reasons, but also importantly are, are, are more scientifically advanced to, to model human biology and physiology, and which are, are thus you know, better suited to, to study human relevant effects. Now that's where organ on chip technology comes in. Basically, an, an organ on chip device uh, is about the size of a credit card typically. It can be made from glass or special plastics, incorporate microfluidic channels, microactuators, microelectronics. Um, and ultimately, these devices create the ideal microenvironment in which to, to cultivate human cells and tissues in the laboratory, you know, mini organs, if you like and making them feel like they're actually in our organs, in our bodies. Uh, so kind of a home away from home. Um, now over the last 10 years or so, there has been a, a real explosion in organ and chip related research, a um, lot of it EU funded with lots of commercial startups appearing too. Uh, and in recent times, the technology has mu matured to the point of really being able to target important applications in several um, sectors. In one in prominent context of use is in the development and testing of, of pharmaceuticals, um, you know, to see how efficacious and, and, and safe they are before going into humans. Um, and there's great interest from pharma companies to, to take this technology in-house, to incorporate it into their processes and, and to exploit it as an enabling technology for innovation in the development of, of new medicines. Um, and that's why we proposed organ and chip as a topic um, for the JRC Sense and Elect workshop last year on, on putting Sanders into science. Um, since many in the organ and chip community feel that, that now is the perfect time to start talking standards, um, both in terms of how standards can facilitate the translation of organ and chip devices and, and, and related methods into commercial applications, um, but also how the process of developing standards itself could can feed back positively into research and development or organ and chip. So I'll leave it there, Fabio. That's my little introduction. I'll tell you more about the workshop later on. Yeah, thank you, Maurice. So you, you mentioned the regulation, then a link with health, how standards can also give a contribution for safety, quality, and enable technology. So these are very important aspects. So the first three guests talked about hydrogen, then quantum, something very innovative, argon on chip, also something that is also quite innovative. But now we go to another layer, which is not so much related with the engineering, the physical part, but on digital transformation. I would like to invite Shannon Kiernan. She's from Sen and Senelec. And please tell us about your experience on how uh, linking research with innovation is helping you to develop this concept of the digital transformation. Thanks, Fabio, and hi, everybody. Yes, I'm working at uh, CCMC, the Sen and Senelec Management Center, which is in Brussels. I've been here for just over a year, actually, so I'm still fairly new to standardization. My background is in digital transformation. So here I'm looking after all of our digital transformation topics, including a couple of projects uh, like smart standards and open source solutions. So with the JRC, um, what we've been collaborating on is a data standards idea. It originally came from the JRC via a call for topics for putting science into standards at the end of 2020. Um, and it ended up finding a home with me because it fits nicely with these projects. Um, so as Fabio mentioned, my case is a little different to the other panelists, uh, particularly um, this initiative is not around a particular subject matter to be standardized, but it's about the way of standardizing. So it's much more um, transversal. 
Uh, and also, unlike the other panelists, mine's at a much earlier stage, um, since the idea has only sort of just been raised uh, or been starting to be developed in the last few months. Um, and so what we're planning on doing is engaging with our community to establish the requirements around data standards and reviewing some of the use cases that have already existed in order to determine to what extent the requirements are already addressed or can be covered by existing projects like the ones I mentioned, smart standards and open source solutions, or whether new projects are needed. The idea itself is basically around ensuring that we have the right standardization deliverables, including formats and processes to support the digital world of today, where data is critical. Um, so formats you can imagine uh, is a Word document still sufficient or do we need to allow other formats? And to what extent do we wanna make that completely open and flexible versus to what extent do we wanna actually ensure there's some consistency? Um, and also the processes, so things like uh, agility um, and continual approval processes rather than a very periodic every few years sort of cycle to create revisions to these things. Um, so these two particular projects I've mentioned, uh, just to summarize them briefly, because I think they'll um, contribute a lot to supporting the data standards concept. So firstly, smart standards, um, it's about making ordinary standards content, which we mean sets of requirements, uh, more granular so that standards users can do more techie things with it compared to a PDF. Um, at the moment, they have to read, or standards users need to read, interpret, and copy and paste from a PDF into whatever processes they're running. Um, so if we make it more granular, they'll be able to do things like import it into a requirements management system, for example. And that makes the process of conforming with a standard faster and more accurate. The other project uh, that I mentioned is Open Source Solutions. It's about publishing designs which if we're talking about data, we could imagine, for example, data schemas and publishing them under an open source license. So it would be a separate deliverable type um, and usually a technology specific reference implementation or a conformity assessment tool for another deliverable. Um, so the, the other deliverable might be, for example, an EN or a CWA, which is written in a technology agnostic way. Um, so having these reference implementations or testing tools would make it much easier for companies to implement the standards because it reduces uh, the costs and time to implement it and they, because they give you a starting point. And so both of these uh, projects effectively make it easier to implement and conform with standards. And by doing so, it encourages more companies to actually implement the standards and they're so we're encouraging adoption through both of these. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. So um, the four panelists, you have already described your projects, what you were doing, what was the topic of your uh, Putting Science into Standards initiative, but this event is also looking forward. So now I would like to ask one question, this one question to all of you. And this question is about, independent of the topic, according to you, what was the main ingredient of, of success of your initiative? What were your lessons learned? But more importantly, what you would recommend for a more successful putting science into standards in the future in the coming collaboration with CNNC And I would like to give you the word to you, Shannon, again. So looking back at your lessons learned and your recommendations for the future. And you have to be very brief because if so, you have about two to three minutes. You're lucky, I will be very brief. Um, <laughs> Like I mentioned, we're actually starting on, on my initiative. So we're at a very early stage. Um, so I can't say we've had success yet, um, but we are certainly aiming for it. So I'm very interested in hearing what the other panelists will say, but I do know that one essential ingredient for our success will be that we need input from our community, um, which includes people like the JRC researchers um, and, and all of the other stakeholders involved um, so that we can understand what the requirements are uh, first in theory, but then in practice, because we need to test things out through pilots so that we can test, learn and improve. Um, so I would like to ask everybody to keep an eye out for announcements about how to get involved. They'll come through a lot of different channels. Yeah, thank you, Shannon. Uh, Claudius, in, in your case for the quantum flagship, the quantum flagship was there before the PSIS. So how did you see that the PSIS benefited the flagship 
what were the positive things that really made possible to then go to the establishing of a roadmap? And what would you recommend that we can do better in the yeah. future? Well, um, I mean, there are, let's say, at least three different questions um, that, that needs to be addressed here. Um, and one of that question is about um, whether standards is only, let's say, a topic for more mature technologies or not. Uh, but I'm sure we, we will address that later on again. Um, so for me, actually, the, the concept of this putting uh, science into standard goes, goes beyond in only having that workshop, right? It is really, um, for us, it was an enabler, um, especially in the beginning of a growing ecosystem. Uh, we have started with the uh, coordinating support action and with the actual uh, quantum flagship initiative back in October 2018. Um, standardization was already uh, a point on our roadmap, but it was a very uh, lucky coincident that right at the beginning of our process, um, let's say that that putting science uh, into standards workshop really pushed that topic even further. Um, and standard uh, standardization is really not only important for high TL topics or products, but it also is really necessary as a baseline that ensures uh, clear and effective communication and alignment between different stakeholders. Um, so for us, the main ingredients of success uh, may have been that uh, the workshop was really at the right time. It was uh, free and open and um, it really ensured an open surrounding and discussion. Uh, the participation um, during the workshop really covered a lot of different possible fields and topics. Um, but uh, perhaps the most, uh, let's say, the most valuable um, point for us really has been um, and that is, is not really something like I will not make make advertisement for this collaboration, but uh, really the the fact that Sensan like and JRC both um, were not only supporting and organizing that workshops, but really showed interest in that because um, for an, for a successful standardization strategy, you need um, at least two different types of expert knowledge. You need expert knowledge of the topic and you need expert knowledge of um, for the field of standardization. And that was something that we not had in our mind. And, and so the, really the workshop was, was a very good uh, starting point. It's put awareness to the topic on the one hand, but also, as I said, set a base for the community driven action on the other hand. And um, lessons learned during our way of um, the establishment of that focus group and that working groups around that, and also working with European experts, um, actually the most critical point was that the process of standardization uh, was new for, for most of them. And also the actual work in the focus group turned out to slightly deviate from other community-based processes. Therefore, our lessons learned is um, we should raise more awareness on national levels for that topic um, and also ensure additional editorial inputs. So um, if we really support the work of European experts by something like translating their opinion into the process um, so that really not every bits and pieces has to be read, uh, has, has to be read by everyone, uh, that, was, uh, that would really be uh, additional uh, additional support and really push that, that topic further, I guess. Yeah, thanks, Claudio. So you, you mentioned that this is very important that you have to be there at the right time, that the workshop was an enabler, but once you, we get to the to fulfill the objectives of the workshop, it's just a starting point then because the work then comes out afterwards. Very important for high TRLs, but then it's a baseline. You keep on mentioning this for communication among different stakeholders. So this is quite yes. important because the workshops are putting together researchers, standardizers, um, industry, policy makers. So it's a way of putting together all these different actors. And also very important, you need to come to count with the interest of those working on the topic and of those working on standards. And for the future, then we need to raise awareness on what is standardization, what it means, what is the process for those that are not familiar with it. Thank you. Uh, Maurice, from your side. 
Yeah, thanks, Fabio. Just picking up on some of those other comments. I mean, um, I mean, our our organ and chip workshop was the most recent one held last year, and um, it was a wonderful experience. It really was. And I was reflecting here with um, Monica, my colleague, who's heavily involved in organising it, um, on you know what were the ingredients of success. And I I think the first one was timing. Uh, um, I, I think Claudia's touched on there. You know, organ and chip is by no means a, a, a fully mature technology. Um, but at the same time, it's come far enough for the community uh, to, to feel ready um, to engage around the topic of standardization. Um, you know, importantly, there was an EU funded project called ORCID um, that was, uh, you know, look, looking at strategic issues around organ on chip and, and it had identified already standardization as being an important thing. So people were kind of ready to engage around the topic. Um, but as I say, you know, th there's not a lot being done. So, you know, there's, there's plenty of new ground to break. The second point I think we, you know, we thought was extremely important was preparation. Um, you know, we would carried out an extensive analysis here at JRC prior to the workshop to identify, you know, existing standards that would be relevant to organ and chip. We started the process of identifying gaps and opportunities. Um, you know, there were a, a lot of preliminary meetings with um, JRC, San Senelec, and, and uh, an ex, you know, big expert group that we put together. So we'd really done the, the kind of conceptual thinking and groundwork before the workshop, and that helped us to structure the workshop and set up the discussions in a really efficient and effective way. So you can't be doing your homework uh, beforehand. And the final thing, really, a key ingredient always are the people. Um, you know, bringing together experts in organ and chip uh, and related sciences and technologies, but but also on standards too, as as um, Claudia has just mentioned, um, it was very educational uh, in that sense. Um, but important is all the people who you know we brought together were all motivated to explore standardization together in a, in a very disciplinary across disciplinary way. I mean, keep keep in mind that organ and chip is highly interdisciplinary. I mean, we're talking about multiple fields of engineering um, plus multiple fields of biology and toxicology and pharmacology. Um, uh, and then, you know, participants from industry, academia, et cetera. And also we had regulators there. So, you know, um, what one, one aspect is really taking the time to listen to each other um, and so on. Um, and the other, the other big advantage in that context was having the European Society of Organ and Chip, Eurox, involved in the preparation of the workshop, um, not only to identify experts um, from different domains, it helped really promote the event to a broader group, um, but, but also it provides now a platform, you know, within the society itself to mainstream the discussion on standards and getting, you know, people from different views and different experiences involved in that discussion. So yeah, timing, preparation and people, they were the three uh, top ingredients from our side. Yeah, thank you, Maurice. I, I, the timing again is becoming an, an important factor, and you have to do your homework, as you as you mentioned on the preparation. And also, I, I like the the concept of the people because you will keep the people motivated, and by putting together these quadrilics of the different stakeholders, becomes very important because if not, if they're not motivated, you are not successful. You cannot prepare your workshop. And again, this wide representation using the, this European platforms is quite important. Now, Bernard is the first one because he, 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 the first one in the sense that the first PSIS workshop in our uh, five year collaboration was um, the hydrogen. So maybe he has, he can say a longer experience of what he went through from the very beginning until where he is now. So please, Bernard. Yes, thank you very much, Fabio. I think a lot of things have, uh, have already been said so far, but I would like to re-insist again on the collaboration at a very early stage. Uh, there is definitely a need to engage with stakeholders as soon as possible, and especially before new development are mature enough to go naturally between codes to the market. So that's very important. We also have a very powerful tools that are uh, the, the, the sector fora. We have the flexibility and agility and for operating uh, a bit like a kind of open platform. And this is very important to engage as soon as possible with all the relevant uh, participants we need to have. What is very important, and that was also something quite 
uh, complex at the beginning is to ensure that all, all the different potential uh, or, or stakeholders we invited have a long-term shared vision about where to go. It's not just a kind of opportunity right at the moment, at the T time, but a uh, T moment, but to have a long-term shared vision. And of course, based on that, we need to agree on the clear scope of work. We can brainstorm during years, but then we need to know exactly where we want to go. And that was something that took quite a lot of time. However, it was necessary to move then through a consensual and a high level of momentum to the um, final, uh, the, the final um, outcomes. And what I also consider as a critical but very important is continuity. It's a long journey and we need to, uh, we need a long-term engagement of the different uh, volunteers. And this is something not always easy. We're speaking before and I think Maurice uh, spoke about the uh, people that's very important and having a, being able to keep motivation and engagement is extremely interesting. And the final point, we got a lot of inputs uh, from the research development and innovative project from Horizon Europe, for instance, but also others. We need to reinforce uh, the consideration of the project holders uh, that the outcomes of their project could be extremely interesting and important inputs to standardization work. This is something very important. They also need to consider standardization as a tool towards dissemination, replication, and scaling, scaling up. And just a final point uh, regarding the tools to, to, to boost innovation to markets. I would like to underline the, the SEND workshop agreement that next seven tools to build momentum and sufficient maturity among the different stakeholders to pave the way to further standardization development. It's a way to really boost consideration of the key role of standardization in, in um, creating, giving opportunities for the market. Yeah, thank you, Bernard. So I hear again the early stage that can be related to the timing. Again, engagement, motivation, uh, a shared vision, which goes together with uh, uh, being uh, prepared, but also the continuity because you have a longer time span in your activity. So you have to keep the momentum and then you have to have the tools to keep that momentum with the continuity and the SEN workshop agreements can be one of the tools to keep that momentum going. Now, I would like to shift to, to a second question, uh, which is more on, on, there is in general a common perception that standards are usually more relevant for the more mature technologies, for high TRL levels. So products that are almost near to the market. But shouldn't we rather talk about the contribution of standards early on in the innovation process? So do you really see a value of, uh, of, for research for, in having standardization bringing in at the early stages and also vice versa? So the contribution of on one side, standards to innovation, also in innovation to standards at lower levels of research. And I would like to start with Maurice also from his experience with the organ on chip, because he mentioned, yeah, that the, the technology is known, but it was the right time. There was a, 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 the ORCID EU project. So how do you see this contribution at the low levels of, of, of TRLs, of, of, of technologies? Yeah, I'm, I'm, really, I'm smiling here, Fabio, as you're saying that, because I mean, God, there's so many misconceptions and misperceptions about standards and it's probably the first thing to tackle I know in our workshop you know what really set the scene was some excellent presentations uh, on standards um, you know really um, addressing some of those uh, myths really <laughs> and um, and I, you know personally and I think uh, you know within the organ and chip community there's plenty now beginning to feel confident to say it's never too early to talk about standards um, what's really key, however, is to be smart about what you're trying to achieve in different contexts uh, to identify priorities and, and really think about what type of standards are required and when. And, and I think this is why the recently created SENS and elect focus group on organ on chip. In fact, we had our um, first meeting of the focus group last week, it was chaired by the Netherlands. Um, it's so, it's so important since we're, we're talking 
about first devising a roadmap, you know, to set out what is what is needed and when uh, before jumping into designing actual standards. And, you know, I think this process within the focus group is so important because we need to bring different organizations, experts together and, and to really take the, the necessary time and effort to, to get everyone on the same page, um, you know, to learn each other's terminology and understanding different perspectives, you know, whether they be from technology perspectives or end user versus regulator versus developer, um, you know, to, to make sure that, you know, we can make the right collective decisions on what standards we want to develop and for what purpose uh, at any point in that, uh, you know, innovation pathway. Um, and you know we can we can you know we can all uh, uh, always rely on the knowledge and expertise and experience that's out there within the standards community. I mean, Shannon is just talking about the work she's doing in 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 the science of standards and standardization, um, and how to approach standards in 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 a way that facilitates and enhances innovation rather than stifling it. And I think that that's the key misconception there that somehow standardization could be a constraining thing rather than an enabling thing. Um, and I think another thing that even this workshop now today, but in, in uh, previous meetings where we uh, where we can learn from other technology sectors. I mean, I know the technologies are different, but many of the problems and challenges you know, one faces in the standardization process are common. Uh, I'm sure Claudius and myself could sit down and have a chat. And even though the technologies are very different, uh, a lot of the issues would be would be the same. So that would be, uh, yeah, my response to your question. Yeah, so, so, so thank you, Maurice. In a way, the roadmap is perfectly fit for research at, say, lower levels of innovation because you are really tackling the what, the when, for what, the standards are required for. So it's it's really that the two are matching. Um, Bernard, in your case, what what is your what is your opinion on 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 this? I think I totally agree again with Maurice. Uh, I think it's, it's a clearly a feedback from from experience. In fact, to me, I, I would like, in addition to that, to also remind that what is very important when we run some innovative work, uh, we go through innovation, new technologies, etc., with the aim to develop some new markets. What is very important is to collect the citizens' or uh, consumers' perceptions. And that's, again, something very important, because if the citizens have a perception, a negative perception, they can turn the potential market to a failure. And this is exactly where standards could start to bring some real added value and benefit. People trust in standards, usually. And so it's very important to engage, to consider what could be uh, considered as a reference so that people will progressively run to acceptance of something that is new. We have seen a lot of examples in the past that uh, were a failure, even if the technology or new, new development were very, uh, very interesting. The second part is also alignment of language. Uh, so terms and definition, as Maurice said also before, we can spend years in speaking and speaking without understanding the same things. And this is particularly true when we are running and discussion in chat with some innovative teams, researchers, they have their own vocabulary. And when they are moving to sharing ideas with the industry, with markets, players, and others, they, 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 they do not understand themselves. So terms and definition is extremely important. And finally, also to consider that Standardization is a booster to dissemination and to um, replication, et cetera. And so uh, innovation to markets, but also to acceptance, which is innovation to market, but market to success. Yeah, thank you, Bernard. So I like this new concept of citizen perceptions to be taken into account in the development of these uh, uh, roadmaps. And now coming to the quantum, because quantum, there's nothing more basic than quantum technologies. And, but now we're talking about standards and quantum. So what is your uh, perception here, uh, Claudius? Well, I mean, um, most of that aspects, I can only second uh, what Maurice and Bernard have said. Um, but as repeating is a very uh, important uh, aspect and tool for didactics, I can, uh, uh, I, I will second that. I mean, uh, as you mentioned, it's uh, quantum technologies is an area where uh, certain ideas uh, not even got realized in the labs, but only exist on paper. I mean, we have really 
parts of that technology that are uh, so early on a TRL scale, um, as I said, that's really only existing on paper. It might sound strange to talk about standards, yes, but uh, for us, standardization has really become more and more important uh, for many, but at least for two reasons. Uh, first, um, standardization, of course, not only covers high TL topics, there are so many other important topics uh, really that you need to align to even be able to discuss um, among different stakeholders. And it's really important that everyone is on the same page, basically. Um, so therefore, of course, you have to agree on very fundamental aspects. And um, the focus group and the working uh, methods around that standardization um, sphere and ecosystem really uh, are very helpful for that. Um, second, standardization goes hand in hand with several rounds uh, of um, something like group alignment or community-based alignment. And um, I mean, if, if, if you really speak a little bit uh, on a more top-down view uh, for us, uh, and I'm sure that's, that's also the goal for all other fields of technology, um, I mean, what do we want to do? We want to have technical serenity. We want to ensure wealth and job creation. Uh, we want to educate, uh, we want to make sure that Europe keeps pace globally, and therefore it is critical that we make the step out of the labs into the markets, and the more early alignment between research and industry takes place, uh, the better and the more early the outcome will be. Um, so that's, I think, a no-brainer, and, and that's really um, a very important point. So um, to make it short and easy, I think, what do we have to lose if we not start so early? A little bit, a little bit of manpower and um, that's it. But what do we have to win if we start early? We can really uh, make sure that we have a better position on a global scale. Um, we have a faster interaction and integration of products from labs into market procedures and system integration. And of course, we also have a better alignment between all European stakeholders and um, I mean, for me, it's it's really, uh, as I said, it's a no-brainer. We do not have uh, much to lose, but we have um, very much that we can win here. Yeah, thank you, Claudio. So I see that the benefits outcome in a large extent, the resources that you have to dedicate in the beginning because you're really starting very early on. Yes. And I must say that this initiative on quantum was probably one of the first worldwide. So by being the first, you're also being the first at world level. So what we do here will have a greater impact at the international level as well. Um, Shannon, in, in your cases, it's digital. It's digital is something that has been there for a long time, data also, but probably also in your case, it's better sooner than later. So can you give your, your, your view on this, on this aspect? Yeah, I think um, one of the defining characteristics of an early stage technology that, that several of, of the guys have already touched on is the rate of change. Uh, a mature technology changes fairly slowly, whereas an early stage one changes really rapidly. Um, and when we think of standardization, um, a lot of people think of flow processes. So um, people tend to think that it, it might not make sense, it might not be suitable for their particular technology that they're trying to standardize. And so one of the things that we're actually looking at with one of the projects I mentioned, open source solutions, is speed. Um, so especially if we're talking about software or software-ish things like data schemas in a specific technology, then people expect that it will be maintained and updated quickly. As things change, as technologies mature, um, as bugs or other issues are identified and fixed. So in this project, we're trying to figure out how to make processes that are faster, more agile and continuous compared to traditional processes um, in order to support that innovative process. Um, so if technologies are changing rapidly because they're earlier in the innovation process, um, then this new deliverable type will support it by simultaneously being that single trusted reference, standardized, um, while still enabling the faster innovation. Um, but so just to clarify, because this is a really common question we get, we're not looking at changing the way that all of the deliverables work, like EMs or CWAs. Um, we're only applying this to our open source uh, designs, so our reference implementations or testing tools for now, because um, it's a big experiment. So 
Uh, it's certainly going to be an interesting learning experience and we'll be very interested to see what the next projects might be that might follow based on that learning experience. Okay, thank you, Shannon. So yes, I have to be agile, the speed. So there's always an opportunity to bring standards into, into a topic, even if it's not at a very low TRL level. Um, I would like now, after I have gone through the panel with some specific questions, also to involve the participants of this workshop to pose their questions. So I encourage all the participants to write their questions on the chat on the Q&A and also that you can vote for the questions. So the questions that are mostly voted will be posed first uh, to the panel. So I would like to ask Andreas to, because I know there are already some questions uh, put on. So Andreas, would be the, the first question that you have from, from the participants? Andreas? Yes. Um, well, I have here one question. Um, are the initiatives to ensure interoperability between various threads of uh, standardization um, from Cecile? Okay, so the initiative between various threads of standardization, maybe could she uh, maybe later on the chat explain better? Can you go to the second question and then I will go back to the first one? Yeah, um, Steve uh, Denton, um, who is a chair of SEN uh, the Technical Committee 250, the Eurocodes uh, um, Technical Committee. He uh, um, provided here a statement uh, that he uh, likes to acknowledge uh, the, the um, exemplary partnership um, uh, he has with uh, SSB unit of uh, JRC. Um, that's the, um, the ELSA lab. Um, he benefited from this uh, strategic relationship um, and um, which evolved over many years. Um, and to his view, uh, um, do, do you share uh, his view that long-term collaboration, uh, collaborative partnerships unlock the greatest value for all parties? Yeah, maybe I can, I, well, I do confirm the collaboration with, Stephen because, with, with Steve Denton because I've been collaborating on the Eurocodes and TC250. But on the question, maybe I would like to address that to Bernard because he has the longest experience from the PSIS workshops. That's okay. No, not not uh, an easy question. See, in fact, um, uh, maybe what I can say, um, when we started this type of um, uh, activities, what is always very important to identify who could be the main, um, let's say, stakeholders, participants, players, but also among uh, the different existing technical committees. I was uh, speaking about before the sector fora and um, uh, the flexibility and agility, but of course, this is not the place where we uh, develop standards. This is not the place where we will, let's say, um, uh, ask for getting expert in, in that sense. That the place where we need to engage through a consensus um, process in order to identify and to make recommendation about promising developments. So um, it is again something very important. And if I understood correctly the, 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 the point, uh, it is also um, the, the idea that um, again, we can't only consider um, the, the, the work as such in the scope dedicated to an existing TC, we need to also see what is around the scope to have a, for a more complete vision to where to go. And again, engaging with the GRC is also very interesting because GRC does not only uh, concentrate on the European context. It has a wide and, and broad expertise worldwide, which means that we also have inputs about a knowledge sharing outside of the country, which means uh, also that we can collect additional inputs to developing standards that are especially relevant uh, novels and, and, uh, and also uh, um, contributing to, to the excellence of Europe. I, think I don't know if it's really answered the question that was a bit uh, wide. Yes, yes. Uh, well, there is also Claudius that may complement the answer to yes. the question. 
Yes, um, thank you. Uh, I mean, the question is, of course, um, what kind of collaboration um, um, you, was, you were talking about? Because uh, um, for me um, or for us, I think the long-term collaboration of GRC and Sensenelec was actually the enabler of um, I mean, it's basically what, what Maurice said, right? It's for a lot of technologies, you have the same questions at same stages. And um, so if you there have a kind of um, long-term expertise and relationship uh, where um, young and, 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 and just starting communities and technologies uh, can rely on, um, that is really, really helpful. I mean, we have, um, Fabio, you mentioned it, we are um, not the very first um, for all topics. There have been, uh, for example, um, already some, some activities around quantum communication that took place in ITU. Um, however, from the overall perspective in a very general quantum technologies wrap up roadmap, we are um, at the forefront, that's correct. Um, and, not every bits and pieces have to be, let's say, uh, worked on again individually, because we can rely on um, experiences, connections, liaisons between uh, JRC, Sensenlec, ITU, um, Etsy, and all the other groups and activities um, that are out there, and do not have to establish all that again by ourselves. And that um, as Shannon mentioned, that saves time a lot and that really improves speed. And therefore, yes, I think that um, a long-term collaboration um, on the one hand in combination with the open-minded look into uh, new and interesting fields of technology is really the key of success. Thank you, Claudius. Andreas, do we have other questions from the participants? Yes, uh, we do have. Um, uh, here is one question uh, from Tim Austin. He is asking um, whether there are any recommendations uh, for how the JRC and uh, Sensenelec might work even more effectively together, like, uh, for example, secondments. Um, that is uh, going also along the collaboration line. Yeah, here, but maybe I can put this question to Maurice because he's from the GRC and he has been part of our exercise in, in being more agile working with uh, people at GRC. Maurice. Yeah, I, um, I'm not sure specifically about the comments, but every, if there's a will, there's a way. Um, if it makes sense, why not? I, I do think, though, uh, the collaboration is um, fundamental. I mean, again, I, I'm speaking as a relative newcomer uh, compared to everybody else in, in this, um, you know, benefiting from this collaboration. And I was like so impressed when um, we started engaging, you know, internally with the team here, but also then uh, with the Sense and Elect team. Um, how we could benefit from, uh, you know, a clearly well established relationship. Um, and you know, um, one you know there there are, there are many aspects that I see that that JRC can bring to the table. I mean, of course, we have extensive scientific expertise in in so many different domains that can contribute you know to the actual development process of standards. Um, but because of our unique position within the Commission, um, you know that that, that solid uh, science and knowledge service of Commission supporting policies. We have a lot of knowledge that we take for granted just about policy priorities, legislative frameworks, regulations. So as, as much as I have, you know, real expert scientists in my unit, they are also very expert in, um, you know, as, as policy analysts and understanding the science, scientific and technical aspects of regulation. And I think that that puts us in a strong position to work with standards bodies. Um, to really and, and all stakeholders to really understand where standards fit in, you know, where are they really key uh, to enabling us to achieve our, our ultimate policy of, you know, objectives. I mean, there are other aspects of JRC too. Um, you know, we have very strong convening power. You know, we 
we are an organization that really thrives on, you know, in, in, in working with networks, bringing stakeholders together um, and send, send a letter course is the same. So, you know, that, that, that I think really um, resonates. Um, and the other, the other element, I think what was important uh, too, what was um, JRC's experience in, in, in working within international fora. Um, and negotiate on behalf of the EU, you know, striving to find consensus. I mean, these are all kind of, um, as, as uh, our, our Director General calls, superpowers that the JRC has that can bring to the table in, in the collaboration with SENS and ELEC. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm personally very excited. Uh, I, I'm, I'm delighted with the success of the PSIS and how it's triggered the creation of the focus group, but I'm even more excited about expanding now our, our interest in, in you know, standardizations in my standardization process in my own domain. And also things like what Shannon is talking about, that agility and looking at actually, you know, um, you know the, that innovation in, ge in generating standards themselves is, is a fascinating aspect too. So, um, so yeah, thanks Fabio. Yeah, thank you, Maurice. So I would like to give a last word to Bernard because we are already at the end of the panel session. So very briefly, Bernard, Yes, uh, thank you. Sorry for. Uh, I, I wanted to react very quickly on that. How to improve uh, again something that is extremely efficient already now. I think uh, there is a big challenge. Uh, the challenge is to keep motivated and engaged talents in this exercise. It's easy to keep or easy. It is uh, easier to keep this engagement for a short period of time, especially. Uh, for the duration of uh, drafting the standards, but here we are speaking about years, and uh, where we need people to get engaged, involved, and and to to be part of these uh, long-term uh, developments. So that's something quite complex to uh, to keep uh, in a permanent manner. Most of the time, even people from private companies uh, who are let's say dedicated to this work for a couple of years for drafting standards, for instance, they are working as volunteer in doing this long-term uh, exercise. As I said, for my working with Hydrogen, more than eight years we started. We still have uh, many of these engaged talents, but it's still a big challenge to keep them all active. Okay, thank you, Bernard. And uh, so I would like to close this panel session th thanking the four panelists of their very precious uh, input to this session. Uh, before going to the closing session of this workshop, I would like to have a second poll, maybe we'll come out on the screen, which is a bit related to the first one. So how was your perception of, or how is your perception of standardization change after today's session? So were we able to change your perception from the very beginning? So I imagine that the no change is related more to, to those that said yes, so that to that 85% that said uh, yes. And then we have the more positive. So I guess it's convincing that those that said maybe, but even the more positive would apply to those that said yes in the very beginning, because we only have 75% for the, for the no change. So I'm going to, to, to show you the polls. So I would be, I would say we're at, quite satisfied of the results of this workshop because it's in, in general more positive even for those that said that they were convinced in the very beginning. So I would like now to, to, to close uh, the event uh, with 15 minutes of uh, closing with um, our two um, invited uh, persons, our speakers. And the first one is Maive Rute. She is uh, from the, the DG Grow, she's deputy uh, Director General. She was before at the GRC, so she was a, a colleague of the GRC before. Um, hello, Maive. Uh, please, yeah, the floor is yours. Good afternoon from my side, and uh, thank you, Fabio. Thank you, former GRC colleagues, and uh, and really uh, very good to see that <laughs> that the um, standardization, um, let's say. Um, Maybe a society, should I call it? You know, all the good people from JRC are in this uh, in this um, meeting today, and the many uh, people from the standardization bodies and the friends of standardization as well. So I'm really pleased to have the occasion to share a few uh, words with you, and I'm also pleased that your uh, little uh, temperature 
measuring here, Fabio has um, shown that the event itself has already delivered you know, positive change. Uh, and at least that the negative <laughs> one, nobody has indicated. So the, uh, the meeting has obviously been already going in the good direction. So uh, let me uh, congratulate um, well, the JRC, of course, but Sen and Senelec certainly as well uh, to this um, occasion today, renewed collaboration. And um, we, are, we are seeing already that the discussions today are pointing to several, let's say, trends or, or lines of work which have been with us previously, but which of course will now get even, uh, let's say, stronger push based on this renewed collaboration. Well, um, in my new job now, in the uh, Directorate General responsible for internal uh, market um, and uh, industry and small and medium-sized businesses, we certainly see that um, having this renewed collaboration between our internal science service and Centenelec is really a very good, very good sign for us. You know that uh, DG Grow is uh, within the commission responsible for the standardization as a policy, kind of a central drive if we wish. And uh, for us, it's really key to work very closely with our European standardization organizations, and similarly to really rely on the, on the scientific expertise of our JRC colleagues. So the, the both sides in the um, event today, for us, you are really our legs and hands, so to say. So it's, it's really important to have uh, this collaboration um, uh, available. Well, you are certainly aware that uh, this year in um, February, we have uh, renewed our standardization strategy. And uh, this has been uh, quite, quite some work. Uh, also, your inputs have been much uh, welcome. We have received, uh, of course, from various stakeholders, substantial inputs for this uh, exercise. And you are aware also that uh, the aim is now to um, step up the ambition in the standardization uh, field. You have seen that the new strategy calls on us to be more assertive, to really make sure that we stand for our European interests in the standardization uh, work, and that we are also becoming more strategic internationally. And I must say that uh, when we published the new standardization strategy now, you know, only basically months ago. Of course, already then we were taking this more forward looking, internationally kind of aware view of the future. But of course, now the last two weeks have made us very keenly aware how much we need to keep in mind this longer term uh, strategic importance of standardization. And I must say that uh, I have also had really very interesting talks uh, with some of the national standardization organizations recently, where we particularly were reflecting, what does it really mean for us uh, in the standardization business? Uh, this kind of, a, um, you know, basically war at, our, war at our doorsteps, which we're now facing. How can we, uh, from this angle, really take some also extraordinary steps to make us stronger make Europe really more well, strategically autonomous, if we wish. And one of the things that we immediately um, identified is the need to mobilize standardization uh, for the uh, purpose of the transition in, in energy. So what we today face is the need to go very rapidly uh, towards reduction of our energy dependence uh, from Russia. And certainly we will need new standards to uh, be able to deploy quickly the uh, renewable energy in Europe and to go for hydrogen. So these type of standards, which we already prioritized before uh, for the green transition purposes, now we are really urgent in an urgent need to, to go forward with it. And if you look at this standardization strategy now, um, which is even more, I would say, geographically and geopolitically aware um, kind of mind, we see, of course, also in the other fields that we have to be able to anticipate better and to prioritize better. And then, of course, base our standards on a solid work, uh, putting also, of course, our, our science in, uh, in the service of our standard uh, making. 
we have to sort out the governance issues and um, together with Sam Senelec and other partners, we are going in this direction uh, as, uh, also without naivete. And we would like to strengthen our global leadership in standard, standard setting uh, bodies also internationally. So all of this is important um, work, which in DigiGrow, we would like to uh, continue doing together with our partners in JRC, but also more broadly in the other commission services. So we see that these occasions to uh, work with you, we are going to be much more even, I would say, frequent and, and closer perhaps than we, than we have done in the past. I'm also happy that in my former job in the Joint Research Center, I had the occasion to be part of this um, very useful work that you do on putting science into standards uh, workshops. And this has been a, a way of also getting really, getting this feeling how science can bring and, and kind of bring this, this kind of frontier, uh, really um, move it, move it uh, forward to the technologies that are coming in the future. So I hope that this type of work will also continue and that from our side in the uh, DG Group, we will put forward a stronger collaboration within the Commission. Uh, we will uh, help building a stronger leadership internationally and then bringing this kind of, maybe I can even call it an ecosystem, an ecosystem of researchers, standardizers, industry, policymakers together in such a way that all together we will be more strategically powerful than, uh, than trying to kind of uh, go individually. I also appreciate that Sam Senelec ha has put forward strategy until 2030. And we see that um, many of these lines uh, from the strategy are very much, of course, in a very good coherence with, with what we are aiming at uh, in DG Grow and in DG Grow side, and of course, uh, as a commission new standardization uh, policy. So with this, I thank you again for a good uh, discussion today. I heard only the uh, last bit of it, but I saw that you had kept the uh, interest high and the questions coming in until the very end. So with this, uh, thanks a lot, and we will continue our good collaboration. Yeah, thank you, Maeve. And you, and you mentioned indeed the standardization strategy, and, and this initiative will be one of the elements contributing to the implementation and making more effective the, the the shade, the, the, the success of, of this uh, strategy and also contributing to the twin transition. Now I'd like to give the floor to Elena Santiago Cid. She's a Director General of Sen and Sendelec. Uh, please, Elena. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, now it's now it's working. No, we have an no. echo. <laughs> Try again. Okay. Uh, no, still an echo. And now we don't hear you. Uh, not yet. Not yet. No. Now, can you hear now me? Now is perfect. Now is perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, we, we have here the kind of um, machine room, and uh, we had to work with uh, several uh, um, equipment, pieces of equipment. So, apologies for that. Uh, um, first, I want to say that um, I'm, I'm very happy of being here today and very honored of uh, being here today, because actually I, I have witnessed uh, in the last uh, years uh, a very fruitful collaboration between the Joint Research Center and, uh, and, Sen and, and Senelec. And I think I still remember, I think that was back in 2010, when I entered the office of uh, Roland Schenkel and uh, we were actually renewing the uh, collaboration uh, between the JRC and then Sen and Senelec because it was after um, Sen and Senelec had their Bakoshman and uh, we decided to, to work uh, uh, further uh, together. And uh, it was extremely inspiring even at, at that time. We have heard also today a lot of references about the strategic value of the standards. Uh, it is for me also very interesting to see that um, always in time of crisis, uh, um, there is uh, a, 
a highlight of, of the strategic value that standards can bring in the market. Uh, I mean, not so long ago, and uh, I know that many people doesn't want to speak anymore about COVID, but uh, that is that was very close to, to our heart. It, it was really a life experience for many of, of us, for all of us. Uh, and uh, we were then asked to develop a standards very quickly uh, for protective equipment uh, and also to support uh, the um, alternative production lines in Europe in order to ensure the supply chain for the, for the single market. Um, we have heard also today from uh, Stefano and from Mai the, the important role that the standards are having in this particular moment uh, where there are uh, very uh, difficult uh, polit geopolitics uh, where uh, standards can indeed uh, play a very crucial role in supporting uh, European values, but also in supporting the, the European economy, the resilience uh, to uh, enhance uh, and uh, accompany the transformation in, in Europe uh, for the twin transition, green and digital, in which we, we truly, truly believe. Uh, and then the, the cooperation between the GRC and, and Sen and Senelec, uh, what we say, the researchers, uh, and those that are closer to the market, uh, which are the standardizers, uh, is, uh, is crucial. It is uh, very important uh, that uh, we build up on this excellent cooperation that we have. Uh, we heard today very, very uh, good references uh, uh, to the work that we have been doing. I think we need to do more. I, I think that my team also knows that uh, normally I am pretty demanding, and I always say, Life cycle of products, uh, life uh, cycle of services is it, getting shorter and shorter. The, the, the time frame between an innovation and between a, a, the, the, the creation of an idea and the development of a research uh, to the market, uh, to putting that idea in the market and disseminating and deploying that idea in the market is, is really getting shorter. And uh, then the standardization uh, um, tools, uh, the processes uh, need to be much better integrated uh, in the in the research activities. Um, but um, we heard today that we have a trustable and reliable experience, and that we heard from those that have been speaking in the in the panel. And I was uh, very happy to hear that because uh, this is what we want to be. We want to be a. a, a an experience that uh, in which the researchers, industry, standardizers can rely in order to take the risk to develop innovative products, services, and put them in the market. Um, we want to improve on speed. Uh, I think Shannon has made reference to all the exercises that we are making and all the efforts that we are making, and uh, many of them also in cooperation with the JRC in order to uh, become digital and to support uh, the digital economy with uh, digital solutions uh, that are not the traditional uh, ones. Uh, and um, the Horizon Europe projects are also uh, uh, a very interesting tool for us standardizers uh, to be able to transform the innovation into the market uh, and the connection between academic researchers and uh, the expertise that we have. Uh, um, I think it's also extremely important to engage uh, the new generation of standardizers, which is part of the European standardization strategy and is part of the sense and the strategy. We realize that uh, it's extremely important to build on education. And uh, we also trust that we can count on the GRC in order to build like education modules where we can engage even more experts uh, in the standardization activities and connecting research with them um, with the standardization. I must say that we were very happy, we are very happy to uh, see the European standardization strategy is very much aligned with the Senate Standard Strategy 2030. We see that uh, it gets a standardization at the a strategic level it deserves, <laughs> which uh, we are very happy uh, to see. Now, I think it's very important to um, stand up to the expectations. And uh, we really have uh, a long work uh, in front of us. Uh, but we also have uh, extremely 
well-motivated team uh, with the thousands of experts and, that are working in the standardization with the excellent team that we have in the ERC. I was extremely pleased today to, to, to hear from, uh, um, of course, Bernard, that uh, I know him for many years, but Claudius and Maurice and, uh, and Shannon, uh, where they were sharing the experiences, um, also many of them based on the putting science into, into the standards. Uh, and um, we need to anticipate uh, future standardization needs. Uh, we are also working with the European Commission in a specific tax force. Uh, and one of the work streams, actually this tax force is timely delivery of European standards for the green and digital uh, single market. But one of the work streams is a strategic alignment. Uh, and uh, that is strategic alignment intends to uh, establish the marriage between the experts from the industry, from the standardization community, with the policymakers, regulators, and bring also the academia and the researchers at uh, as early as possible in the discussions so that we can really anticipate uh, uh, policy needs, taking into account uh, the power that we have uh, in innovating in new technologies uh, and also the, deploy the deployment of those uh, innovations. Uh, in the European market that will lead us to the point that might be meant uh, on leading international uh, markets or leading a standardization at international level that will open markets, but will also spread European values outside Europe because that is something that uh, we uh, really take care of. So um, I'm very excited uh, as we have um, built a lot <laughs> in the last uh, uh, years, uh, more than 30 years of cooperation from what uh, I heard, even if I only lived uh, uh, the last uh, 12 years. Uh, and um, I'm lo really looking forward to uh, another many more years of, of cooperation where we can see tangible results of, of what we do. We are getting closer. We know each other, I think, better. We also have learned a lot to build on the wing wings of both um, activities that at the end of the day need to become one. And um, uh, I think that uh, it's always very good to celebrate uh, and to build on that experience, but also to establish ambitious projects and goals uh, for the future. And that's what uh, I think we all want for the cooperation between SENS and ELEC and the, and the ERC. A big, big thank you to all the panelists. Uh, of course, uh, uh, also we have uh, Stefano Calzolari, who is the new champion on innovation in Sen and Senelec, so it was great to have him here. Maide also, with whom we have been working in the in the past, and it, it's very good to, to see her. She's committed to standardization. Uh, I suppose that is because you like it, Maide, too. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's a very important element uh, to get engaged. Fabio, with whom we have had uh, Again, a, a, an excellent collaboration. And as I said, all our panelists, uh, Bernard, Claudius, uh, Maurice, uh, Shannon, and uh, of course, uh, Stephen, that uh, made the opening remarks uh, uh, this morning. So thank you very much for all the um, participants to the, to the workshop. I know that we are running a little bit uh, uh, out of time, but um, I, I also believe that uh, this is our future and our sustainability depends on uh, how well we perform. So um, let's celebrate and let's move on. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you, Elena. And also from our side, you're a trusted and reliable partner for us. Thank you. And thank you to all, to all for participating and keeping with us until these last 10 minutes of the workshop. Thank you. Thank you, Fabio.